they still are a purpose for you in a sense, but it's certainly not day to day. At least I hope it's not. Uh, it's probably better for parents of adult children to let them have their own lives uh, mostly. So again, you have a kind of an emptiness in your life for a while until you find other engagements that are purposeful. So my first answer is that being purposeful is a strength that develops like a muscle. This is great because you just made a distinction which is a big one and for me, purpose, purposeful. The Life Review, it's, it opens up a treasure chest of reflections and memories that gives you clues about the best way forward. Hello everyone, I'm Larry Weeks. Welcome to another episode of The Bounce Podcast. What do you think your purpose is right now in your life? Have you even thought about it lately? I'm not asking this in the context of some metaphysical situation. <laughs> That's fine. But pragmatically speaking, there's a great movie circa 1989 called Say Anything. In it, John Cusack uh, is cast as an underachieving nice guy named Lloyd Dobler, who unexpectedly spends his post-high school summer romancing an uber-achiever valedictorian Diane Court. And there's this great scene where on just their second date, Lloyd is having dinner at Diane's house where there's guests uh, along with her father. And her father puts him on the spot about his future plans. Give it a listen. So Lloyd, you graduated Lakewood, right? Yes, sir. What are you gonna do now? Yeah, Lloyd. What are your plans for the future? Spend as much time as possible with Diane before uh, she leaves. Seriously, Lloyd. I'm totally and completely serious. No, really. You mean my career? Um, I don't know. I've, I've <clears throat> thought about this quite a bit, sir, and I, I would have to say, considering what's waiting out there for me, I don't want to sell anything, buy anything, or process anything as a career. I don't want to sell anything bought or processed, or buy anything sold or processed, or process anything sold, bought, or processed, or repair anything sold, bought, or processed. You know, as a career, I don't want to do that. So, uh, my father's in the Army. He wants me to join, but I can't work for that corporation. Um, so, what I've been doing lately is kickboxing. Which is a uh, new sport, but I think it's got a good future. As far as career longevity, I don't really know, because, you know, you can't really tell. If you're eight and six as a fighter, you know, it's no good. You know, you have to be great. But I can't really tell if I'm great until I've had a couple of pro fights. But I haven't been knocked down yet. I don't know. I can't figure it all out tonight, so I'm just going to hang with your daughter. Now, part of this sticks with me as a crystallization of the multifaceted aspects of purpose. Lloyd has two at this moment. He wants to be a kickboxer, but as realistic as to not know how it's going to turn out. And he wants to hang with Diane. This is what he knows at the moment. It's such a great line, and let me use it here propositionally. We need to figure out how to live in the moment, not postponing life for some future imaginary version of what life might be, while we set goals or while we set an intention. We're directional as to where we want to head. When my mother passed away, my father lost his, a lot of his purpose very late in his life maybe when you need it the most, and he became depressed. Now, he finally found his next thing, I'll, I'll put it that way. And I'm reminded of a quote from another great movie, The Shawshank Redemption, get busy living or get busy dying. Gaps in whatever we're doing directionally, they take us by surprise or can take us by surprise. We all have reasons why we do things, and sometimes those reasons aren't as evident or front and center for us until they're removed, until there's this gap. Okay, you know, we become unmoored. And this is where a life review might be helpful for those of you going through this kind of a situation or transition, and there may be a, a gap there as to what you're doing while you're doing it. So there are times when taking stock has special meaning, uh, and it calls for a mindful, sustained effort, like a major transition, graduation from high school, a marriage, divorce, a loss of a loved one, uh, loss of a loved one, 
a health crisis leading to some physical incapacity, a new job, loss of a job, retirement, all can trigger this reflection. And it's very helpful to take the reflection and put some structure around it. Hence the the life review. And that's the focus of this podcast. My guest is William Damon. Uh, William is a psychologist and professor at Stanford University and senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He's been designated as one of the 50 most influential living psychologists in the world today and as one of the world's leading scholars of human development. Bill has done pioneering research on the development of purpose in life and wrote the influential book, The Path to Purpose, as well as his most recent book, A Round of Golf with My Father, which is also about purpose and specifically life review. His current work includes study in exploring purpose in higher education and a study of family purpose across generations. And he's been elected to the National Academy of Education and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So on the podcast, we cover some of these topics like purpose, his definition of purpose, whether you can find it, lose it, make it. And we talk about the difference in the definitions of purpose as it relates to uh, vocations, avocations, how purpose can change over time, purpose as a noun versus as a verb, having purpose versus being purposeful, which was very helpful for me. We talk about the life review, a life review, and what that is and how it relates to his story of his new book, A Round of Golf with My Father. And I ask why he thinks the life review is important. What are the benefits of looking back as it pertains to purpose? So uh, very helpful for me. And one of the reasons I had Bill on is because there are a lot of you, my listeners, who are going through uh, life transitions, whether it be career or otherwise. So I give you William Damon. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm delighted (laughs) to be here. So in our preamble here, we were talking about purpose and then focusing on the life review. And I'd like for you to define for the audience purpose. And I say that because it seems self-evident and I think we all think we know what it means and we we probably do, but there is a an absolute oh, devil- yeah. definition you give in the book. And in fact, you talk about the history of purpose and what it means from a standpoint of philosophy and theology and social sciences. I, I think you found some inconsistencies, which is normal in scholarly fields. But then you you came to some consensus. Sure. Well, I'm I'm really glad you asked that question because purpose, of course, is part of the vernacular. And so people use it in lots of different ways. But if you're doing if you're doing science or practice, and psychology is both a science and a practice, like medicine, uh, you need to be sure that every word is defined in a way that it means one and only one thing, and it's not confused with other words. And so it's fine for people, you know, in common language to talk about purpose interchangeably with passion or meaning. You know, it's a very common phrase to say, I want to have a life of meaning and purpose, as if they're kind of the same thing. But of course, if they were the same thing, you would only need one word for it. And actually, they mean different things. As do a lot of the words that are confounded with purpose in the common language. Purpose captures a very special psychological capacity. And I'll tell you the elements of it. And we actually, when we started doing work on purpose uh, for research, we spent almost a year reading theology, philosophy, the few works in psychology that had gone into purpose before, to really figure out exactly how the word is used and what it means in these scholarly fields. And here are the important um, components of it. First of all, it's a long-term commitment. It's not a one-shot deal. Uh, And I'll distinguish it from a one-shot deal by saying, for example, if you jump into a river to save a drowning child, That's a heroic, wonderful thing to do, but you wouldn't say that's your purpose in life uh, because you're not hanging out at rivers watching for children to drown. You just did that once. Purpose is something that goes on for a period of time, and you keep at it. You're committed to it, and 
you have some sense even of resilience that if it's hard, you keep doing it. If you don't succeed, you stick with it. So long-term commitment is number one. And then there are two other distinguishing landmarks of purpose. One is that it is meaningful. It does have to be meaningful. It's not only meaning, and that's why I distinguish the words meaning and purpose. It goes beyond meaning, but it has to be meaningful because nobody can order you to do a purpose if you don't believe in it. If you if you're a child and you are told to do homework, you ought to do the homework, I I believe. But you wouldn't say the child is being purposeful about it unless the child him or herself actually brought the self to it and it was meaningful. It, it's something that the child owned. So purpose does have to be meaningful, but, and this is where it goes beyond meaning, it's an attempt to accomplish something that is of consequence to the world beyond the self. So there are lots of things we do that are meaningful in life that are important. Again, I'm not denigrating any of these other capacities. You can go to a movie that's really meaningful or read a poem or sing a song or do lots of things. But going to a movie is not a purpose. It's something you do or even reading a poem. It's enlightening. It may deepen your understanding of things. But a purpose is not only about you. It's an attempt to make a difference in the world, to accomplish something, to do something that matters to the world beyond the self. So when you get all of those components together, long-term commitment, meaningful, an attempt to make some contribution to the world beyond the self, you have a very special psychological capacity. And the reason it's important to recognize all of those components is that they are the reason that purpose has such an effect on the world and on the self. Purposeful people make a difference. They accomplish a lot because they are committed and they stick with things and they are highly motivated. And as far as the benefits to the self, purposeful people, because it is beyond the self, they tend to be resilient. They tend to snap back from defeat. They tend to not be so self-absorbed because they are dedicated to something long-term that they believe in that will matter to other people as well. So having purpose brings a lot of benefits to the world and the self, or at least it potentially can. It's not a silver bullet. It's not the answer to life. It doesn't create happiness or do any magical thing, but it does give certain character strengths to the person and adds a lot of uh, motivation to the activity, which can mean that the activities of the person often are consequential. Would a purpose have to be tied to a goal? A purpose is a type of a goal. It's a, okay, so it is in it, the it, classification of goal. Or yes, goals. it's a, okay. It's a very particular kind of goal. Uh, I mean, I had a goal today when I drove to campus of finding a parking place. That's a goal, but it's not a purpose. A purpose is this very special kind of goal that involves a long-term commitment to accomplish something that's meaningful and so on. But it is in the it is in the bucket of goals. Yes, it's a very special kind of goal. Could there be purposes, plural, versus, yes, because absolutely. when you were talking, I, I'm thinking of this overarching purpose where everything oh, uh, okay. kind of falls under it. But I wrote down the question, well, can I have purposes, like, yes. or is it always one overarching? That's a really great question. Uh, the answer is, first of all, yes, people have multiple purposes. Many people do. I mean, not everybody has purposes at all, but people that have purpose, uh, often, to give you an example, they they might have a vocational purpose. They're a doctor and they want to cure people. That's the purpose. At the same time, they have a family. Uh, they may be raising children. That's a purpose. There may be a faith purpose. Uh, serving God, that may also be, and in some but not all cases, there are hierarchies. Uh, faith often has a hierarchical component where the person believes that he or she is serving God by everything else, all the other purposes that he or she is pursuing, but that's not the only way to do it. There just could be multiple purposes that are all at the same level. But yes, many people have multiple purposes. 
And one of the reasons I'm so curious about this topic is Bill, many years ago as a very young man, I went through an existential crisis. I lost a fiance and then I lost a friend. And then there's some things that kind of contributed to this wholesale topsy-turvy reflection on my life. And then Mm -hmm. I got out and I was very involved in church and I knew what my purpose was then, that, Mm -hmm. that, that I was going to be this and do that. I don't think I ever reached that overarching, hey, this kind of calling. I don't know if you understand where I'm going. No, with I do. I, I do. So, and there are a couple of different components to the question. So, let me start with the first part, which is: Do people lose purposes and then go on in life? Great. And that maybe re, maybe regain them. And yes, that's not only common; it's it's usual actually, because a lot of the purposes that you start out with in life as an adolescent. Adolescence is really when people begin to have the capacity to think long-term in a way that they can develop some purposes. But a lot of them are unrealistic. They don't work out once the young person meets the real world. Turns out the occupation person wants to be a lawyer or something, and turns out that uh, he or she discovers he hates she hates law <laughs> yeah. and when she hits law school and so on. So it's very common for people to have purposes for a period of time and then and then lose them and then take on new ones. And often when you lose them, you do go through a period of, I won't call it depression, it's not quite that severe, but aimlessness or, or uh, discouragement. But the capacity of being purposeful was promoted by establishing that early purpose. So you are more equipped to develop purposes later by the fact of having an initial purpose, even if you decide that purpose is not for you or it's not working out or many transitions in life uh, necessitate your giving up on a purpose. Uh, A lot of, of course, a lot of people retire. Most people retire uh, late in life and they no longer are going to the same office every day or or doing whatever it is that they were contributing to society, but they still need purpose in their lives. And that's why there's a whole movement these days called Encore Purposes for people who retire. It's very important that they still become purposeful, but their old purpose is no longer relevant. Uh, and uh, often, you know, of course, if you raise children, they move out of the home. They still are a purpose for you in a sense, but it's certainly not day-to-day. At, at least I hope it's not. Uh, it's probably better for parents of adult children to let them have their own lives uh, mostly. So again, you have a kind of an emptiness in your life for a while until you find other engagements that are purposeful. So my first answer is that Being purposeful is a strength that develops like a muscle. This is great because you just made a distinction, which is a big one. And for me, purpose, purposeful. Yes, exactly. Purposeful to me is within my grasp. I can be purposeful, right? You've got it. Yep. I've always looked at purpose in a sense of some metaphysical ray of light that has to hit me and say, this is what you're supposed to do. I gave up that long ago, but still there is this kind of mystical quality to to purpose where I can be purposeful. That gives me some agency. I can go be purposeful, but I could go a long time if I'm just waiting for purpose to strike me, right? Yeah, and and purpose, you're absolutely right. And there is something transcendent. There's a transcendent feel to purpose, but it doesn't have to be magical or heroic. And in fact, Larry, if you look at what you're doing, when you're being purposeful, if you really look at it, you you actually do have a purpose that you can define. Uh, the work you're doing now is a purpose. You're trying to communicate ideas to people through a medium, ideas that you believe in, that you think are valuable to people. I'm convinced that if you thought they were harmful or meaningless, you wouldn't be getting out of bed every morning and, and doing your podcast. So there are a couple of things that's important to realize. First of all, you're absolutely right. There's a distinction. The distinction between being purposeful and a purpose is being purposeful is your inner strength that you develop, like a muscle or or uh, the ability to think, and it becomes a character strength over the years. The purposes that you acquire, they're not given to you uh, externally. You you choose them yourself, and so there's agency in that. They are engagements that you can define as particular goals, and those goals, you either meet them or you don't meet them, you 
stick with them for a period of time. And then as life changes, you may give up on those particular goals and move on to new goals. And those new goals are new purposes. But it's very important that uh, people realize, and I really want to emphasize this, purpose is not a larger-than-life heroic or magical event. It can be extremely ordinary. In fact, this is the old idea of calling from theology, too. I can be a street sweeper. Uh, I can be anything. People that come into your homes and or into buildings and clean up, if they believe in what they're doing and they understand that they're serving people, it's like that old idea of a calling where you were called to do something in the sense that you believe you're serving. And that is a purpose. It doesn't have to be heroic. It's every bit as noble to do that as to be uh, the president of a huge uh, organization or a country or something like that. So it's not an elite concept. It's very ordinary. There's nothing more ordinary than raising children. That is a very noble purpose, for example. Um, so I, I do think it's important to realize that the purpose is not something that kind of strikes you like a bolt of lightning or, uh, you know, St. Paul, uh, you know, uh, a vision or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but it's something you choose, that that you try out, you see if it works. And there are three qualities that people go through when they try out. First of all, are you interested enough in this to stick with it? Because if you find it boring, you know, if you, you know, if you if you thought your purpose would be to be a computer scientist and you just get bored by math or something, that wouldn't work. Are you talented enough to contribute something, to do a decent job? I always use the example, you know, if you're five feet five tall, you're not going to um, aspire to be center for the Golden State Warriors. I mean, it's just not realistic. Or if you're tone deaf, you're not going to be Beethoven. You know, I mean, in other words, you have to check out what you are capable of. And third, does the world need it or can the world benefit from it? When those three things click in, and it takes a lot of trial and error, experimentation to see, am I interested? Am I talented enough to do this? Is there a need in the world? Then the purpose is formed, and then the capacity of purposefulness begins to develop. So let's say, I'll use a real example of my own life. So I've got this silly thing that I'm planning. It's going to be set in the 1980s, but I'm going to have it be like a high school prom. And I thought to myself when I was doing this, why am I doing this? The why question is absolutely central in purpose. And it's something in my educational writings, I always say, you've got to get those students to be asking the why question. Why am I studying chemistry? Why am I doing this? Because when you can answer that, that can help you become purposeful about it. If you can't, you're you're in a blank state. Well, yeah, because I like the idea and I float to my friends like, oh, that would be fun. And I, you know, there's this fun aspect. And but then as I as the rubber would meet the road, I'm like, well. Am I going to do this? Am I not going to? Why? As I dug into it, Bill, I thought one of the things that I love or like is connection. I like to connect with people. There's an element to that connection and seeing people laugh and have fun. So here's this goal. Yep. Got to create an event. Got to book this. Got to do that. Got to do that. But here's this purpose above you it. it. You got it. Or thread. A thread. Is that a way That's to look it. at it? Is that it's, okay. it's exactly right. a way to look at it. That's right. Purpose is the greatest motivator. That's the power of purpose, is it keeps you going through thick or thin because you believe in the goal that you're trying to achieve and you understand what it is. You understand why you are, you know, if you're a student, you know, why am I sitting in this biochemistry class? Oh, I know why. I want to become a doctor. <laughs> if I if I don't stick with this and and learn this stuff, I am not going to be a very good doctor. Answering that why question, which is the question uh, number one of purpose, is what gives you that motivation to hang in there and gives you energy. Yeah, because, you know, I have some friends and there's a lot of turmoil, obviously, across the world. And on a scale, you know, there are people that have it a lot worse than those of us in the West. But there are people that have lost their jobs and they're reexamining their life. And I want to get into the life review and how that can be mm -hmm. helpful. But obviously in the tech world, I know I experienced when I left Google, my identity was kind of part of being at Google because, you mm -hmm. know, at the time, certainly people 
would have an opinion of, of a Googler that were, that was fairly high, but I, you know, I voluntarily left, but I was, you know, I was like, okay, now what, you know, what, what, <laughs> you know, sure. it's my next thing. I didn't realize how much I had unconsciously kind of wrapped my identity in that. And now I have friends that are going through it forcibly. Right. So here's where I think this discussion of purpose is valuable, right? Okay. Yeah. Now, what do I have as a purpose above what whatever my job that, is exactly and and i think uh, that if, doesn't if I, get cut right yeah that yeah yeah exactly and, and if i were one of those and i'll make a prediction uh a lot of the folks that are going through a rough time right now and of course losing a job is is one of the challenging experiences of life um it's right up there with anything else that can happen that is a uh, is a tough outcome to deal with but you can recover from this. And in fact, often people that recover from any of these negative outcomes come back stronger. But the way to, I would predict that the people that will recover from this particular set of tech layoffs and the economic downturn in the tech industry is that they will remember why it is they got interested and what it was they believed in about the work they did for whatever corporation they were working for. And find new ways to accomplish that, uh, maybe create a new startup or or look around for a, other opportunity that draws on the same interests and talents and serves the same overall purpose of improving people's lives through technology. And it's the people that hang on to that that I think are going to I would predict they're the ones that are going to bounce back and they may do something uh, amazing that uh, that they could never have done if they had kept their comfortable, well, uh, well-paying jobs. I'm not diminishing how hard that is, and it is rough. And uh, of course, I sympathize with that. But I've seen this happen in lots of areas of life where catastrophic outcomes, which nobody welcomes, can be redeemed, can actually lead to forward development and uh, all kinds of advances that never would have happened uh, if life had just gone along in a tranquil, settled way. And that does uh, actually bring up the idea of the life review, which is why I wrote my um, most recent book about, about my own life and some of the difficult outcomes that I had regretted over the years and finding ways to come to terms with them that gave me a path forward that I believe is actually a, a better pathway forward than if I had never reflected on those outcomes and thought about them in a purposeful way. So I remember when, when I took some time off, I immediately picked some projects that I wanted to do. So goals. I wanted to do this podcast. I want to try this, this, and this. Those are the purposeful activities, right? Choosing yes. goals. And to your point, instead of waiting for the purpose, you can use a life review. And we'll talk about that on, on reflecting uh, where I want to go forward. But goals are, are also the way to get there, right? They, they may be small goals or what have you, but it instills a sense of purpose. Hey, I, I, I want to go achieve or accomplish this. But they're not disconnected. The life review actually helps you select from all the possible goals you could have and select them in ways that fit into the kinds of experiences you've had and the kinds of talents and the kinds of things that you found satisfactory and satisfying and fulfilling in your life. So it, it it's the life review, it's, it opens up a treasure chest of reflections and memories that gives you clues about the best way forward. They're not disconnected, but what you're absolutely right. The the task is to choose good goals going forward that will work for you, that will be purposeful and will bring you that great sense of integrity and you know who you are. And that's what we're always seeking in life is, yeah. uh, is that. But the life review, and this is something that, that, by the way, I found out, I mean, this is one of my late life discoveries, is how valuable the past can be if you approach it in the right way and how valuable it can be in helping you find the right pathway forward. So it's not getting stuck in the past. It's preparing you for forward-looking growth in life. That's what I discovered myself as I started looking into my own life and using the life review for that reason. 
in your book, you you talk about some of the history of the life review process. Could we just touch on that briefly? And I think you mentioned it as a form of uh, reminiscing, right? But it, was it Butler? Um, yes. Yeah, so so okay. let, let, let me sort of back sure. up a, a little bit and just give you the context of this, because as I said, I found myself able to learn something new in life, even you know as I was 60 years old, all of a sudden. In terms of my work on purpose, I'd been writing about purpose for about 10 or 15 years, and I wrote The Path to Purpose, which is a book that I think a lot of people use. And I thought I knew all about it. And I figured, just as you and I have been talking, I thought the most important thing about it is that it's forward-looking, it's a commitment that keeps you going ahead of time, and it's kind of a prospective approach to life. You define yourself and invent your future by the things that you take on, that you believe in, that you pursue, and that you dedicate yourself to. That's what my understanding of purpose was. And I still believe all those things, but I was missing something very important. I'll give you the quick uh, version of the story. I grew up without a father who disappeared in my life, and I knew nothing about him. My mother told me he was missing in World War II. He was a soldier in Germany, never came back. Everyone around me assumed that he, in my school records, he was killed in action. I later found out that no, he had actually just abandoned us and not come back, and he remarried and so on. At that point, I was an adult. I didn't want to know anything more about him. I said, and this is the part about the past, I kind of said, you know, don't look back. Uh, I'm, I've got an important bunch of things to do in my own life. Um, How I, old were you at this point? I was, at, at this point, a young, youngish adult, 30, 40 years old, okay. something okay. like that. And every now and then I'd hear some clue about where he was, but uh, I didn't want to have anything to do with him. I didn't want to identify with this guy. I figured he was a no-account scoundrel. Uh, and as I said, I had a very much of a don't-look-back approach to life, which is don't get hung up on stuff that happened. Uh, you know, I've I've had a good run in life. I'm but doing for, fine. For, for, but for your whole life up to that point, you thought he was dead right i thought he was dead until until my 20s and then and then and then i found out he was alive but i didn't want to know anything about him when i turned 60 ish one of my daughters got interested in the grandfather that she never met and that nobody ever talked about curious kids yeah right kids (laughs) and so she kind of dragged me kicking and screaming into this she called me one day and said dad I don't know if this is going to upset you but i figured you can handle it you're 60 years old now uh i found out all about your father And she did an internet search. Turned out the guy, at that point he was dead, but he had quite a remarkable life. And including a lot of things to admire. Uh, He um, was a diplomat. He stayed in Germany after the war to do very important work for the State Department. He did this one irresponsible thing, which is he abandoned my mother and me, and that was hard to forgive. But it got me very interested in him and in my own life and what happened to me that I never recognized early in life because of him. That, for example, I went to the same, my mother sent me to the same school that he went to, and I never knew I went to the, that he went to that same school, and that made a huge difference in my life and lots of other things. So I got interested in trying to figure out, well, who was this guy? What was his life like? And what was my own life like? And how did we maybe connect in some ways that I never knew about? That's when I discovered the life review process. The life review was a method developed by a psychiatrist, Robert Butler, very famous uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author, uh, first director of the National Institute on Aging. And early in his life, when he was more of a researcher, he developed a method that had people go back over their lives in a structured way to look for the things that were positive in their lives, not just things that they resented or that they uh, regretted, mistakes they made, because he found that a lot of his patients that were depressed would get hung up on that. 
oh, the road not taken. If only I had married Sally instead of Sue, or if I had bought Amazon stock at pennies a share, like some my stockbroker recommended to me, or you know, if I hadn't had this accident where let's say, you know, I lost my leg or something like that, even catastrophic stuff. He said, you know, there's ways to go back in your life and think about, first of all, things you learned, strengths that you developed in overcoming these negative events or these challenges, and really uh, affirming your own identity and recognizing that you would not be the person you are now if these things hadn't happened and valuing that person you are now. So that was the approach I took. I did a case study of one. I wrote the book. The book is called A Round of Golf with My Father. Now, of course, I never met my father and I never had that round of golf with him, but I did learn that he was a great golfer. And when I learned that, that was the thing among all the other things that I had to resent. That was the thing that got me most angry because I love golf and I kept saying to myself, how come the guy couldn't come around even once to teach me how to play golf? And it sounds trivial, but that was the canary in the coal mine that revealed to me that I had all of these hidden resentments that were still bothering me after decades and decades of living, you know, uh, right up into my adulthood that I had denied. And in the book, I quote Faulkner about the past who says, who wrote in one of his plays, the past is not dead. It is not even past. And I thought that was very wise, and it was absolutely right, that it was still part of who I was. And I had to work that through. So anyway, the book in the book, I have this uh, kind of epiphany moment where I uh, got a hold, as I discovered the new side of my family, my father's side, one of my cousins found an old set of golf clubs of my father's in his garage that had a scorecard in it. And I went to the country club where the scorecard was from in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and I played a round of golf against my father's scorecard, sort of imagining he was there with me. Mm. And it, it sounds like a minor thing, but it was actually a very redeeming... Sounds cathartic, yeah. Exactly. Uh, it, it, it was symbolic of everything else, else I did in the book, and I discovered a lot more about him. But it did give me that sense of redemption. And that is the point, I think, of going back through the, your life and the life review way back or even recently back, redeeming those events that happened that you regret that, you know, of course, I wish I'd grown up with a father, but I regretted that. But here's a way to redeem it. I found things about him to admire. I could forgive him. I found strengths in myself that I developed because I had to do it on my own without a father. And so I could redeem all of these difficult things and then bring them forward to give me a better understanding of myself and my own strength so that going forward, I could forge a new purposeful path in life. And that was the connection between life review and purpose. Did you talk to him while you played? I didn't uh, verbally, but I did imagine, I looked out over the scenery and it was a beautiful, glorious golf course of the type I could never have afforded. I mean, he left us in very desperate financial condition. So I could never afford to go in a country club myself when I, or, or take lessons when I was a child. But I could see this beautiful course that he played on and i imagined him looking at it and uh what his childhood must have been like uh, in being there and and the shot i i could see how he played each hole uh i could see how he scored and so i i, I did ima i certainly imagined that he was there with me yeah how did you do against the score i mean it was a uh, good good question uh everybody asks me that when they read the book he was a very talented golfer, oh, okay. uh, but um, I actually uh, I beat his score. But he parred six of the he parred six of the holes, and I with parred old, four with with, with old yeah, technology, exactly. yeah, with yeah, old, so. old balls. This is yeah. pre titleist uh, old yeah. wooden clubs and everything. And he he parred six, I parred four, and uh, so he actually played. He outplayed me. Yeah, I'm a tennis guy. I, there was a day where this club had. Uh, Wood racket day. So we all dressed in oh. white and played with it's the hardest. It's very difficult to play with those little wood yeah. sticks that the head sizes are half the way I remember they are them. now. I, when I was a kid, I played with one. Yeah. Oh. And comparing the older pros to the new pros, I, it would be yeah. very interesting because yeah. of the what they were able to accomplish with those 
with the with, with exactly. those wood sticks. It was not easy to hit those balls. Or so the technology yeah. nowadays just is very forgiving across the board. Oh yeah, and and I in fact I I have a, a chapter in the book. The book is not about golf; it's about psychology. But I do have a chapter about golf. And I describe how t- the company Titleist redid their golf balls because in my father's golf bag were old Akushnet balls pre Titleist. Mm. And that was before the technology. I think they used some MIT design yeah, yeah. in 1935. <laughs> wow, I didn't even and, think about the, but yeah, wow. Yeah, that's even no, harder. So, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So wow. it's, 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 I mean, it's, this is the fun part. And I will say this whole life review process, including uh, discovering historical things, even about golf for the military that like I had to do, it's amazingly fun. It's not a grim, you know, digging in a Freudian way, digging into past traumas. You're an amateur historian and you're uncovering letters that people wrote and historical facts about technology, a whole world that uh, is, is new and exciting. So I found the life review to be thoroughly thrilling. Uh, as a his, I'm not a historian, but doing a little of that was just amazing. But in your case, the life review was a little bigger in the sense that you have a father that you didn't know, that you're rediscovering. So there's a lot of history, just unknown history, that you're not really recalling memories. You're you're piecing together yeah. uh, so, something about... But, uh, but I, I I got to interview. There were still people that they were in their nineties. Okay. Yep. So uh, including the wife of a colleague of his when he served in Germany, wonderful woman. My father's second wife was still alive. Uh, she was a French ballerina, uh, and I got to have a conversation with her. So I could do interviews. I could look up old war records. I could go back to my school, which gave me his records, including letters from my grandmother, uh, original letters and grandfather. So as I said, it, th- there were a lot of thrills about the discovery process. And I really felt that I almost knew him by the time I finished, uh, especially after meeting some of his old friends. So we talked earlier about purpose and we talked about you know, when you lose purpose, you can get another one. You you can be purposeful uh, by setting goals and and picking the next thing. And yes. I, and I think it was very interesting that you said people have multiple purposes over over a lifetime B- because we also talked about how you could have this huge overarching purpose and lose that, and now yep. you've you're kind of lost. In fact, you said that's fairly common that that happens a lot. You gave the lawyer example and the minister example. I, Give the ministry sure. example. So sure. let's tie those together. And is there a general map or schema on how to do a life review? Or is it as yeah. simple as just go back over the milestones, the decades of your life and and, and yeah. pick out certain memories? By the way, I want to do one because I went down, I told you at the beginning that I went down this rabbit hole in the internet looking at life reviews and people had done them and there's formats here and there. And so I've already got one of the ideas I have, Bill, tell me what you think of this. I'm going to take music from Mm. X decades and look up the um, top songs of those decades to see which one I recall. I'm going to play it with a notebook and I'll see what memories come up. And then I'm I'm going to write them. I've never thought of that, but that's a wonderful method. Well, because Uh, it just music to me puts me in a place. No, I and I, I do the same thing. Not I'm realizing not consciously, but the music brings back all kinds of relationships. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and, sure. yeah. So yeah, and I'm a, and we're, we're we're very lucky. We grew up in a in a, in a time in a country that's had wonderful music, uh, just amazing. Every type from, from we're, country to rock to jazz. Exactly, and it's I, been I, amazing. You know, what's great is that we're listening to. Yeah, you know, I got XM, but you know, I, I do the Spotify thing. But we're we're listening to the XM radio, one of the older stations and my wife and I will hear a song that we haven't heard yeah, exactly. in 50 years. Like, I know. Oh my gosh. And then the memories, I it's know. like, well, come back. So, anyway. So, so, so you've just invented one great uh, method, uh, uh, addition to the method, but the, the general answer to your question is everyone's had such individual lives that there is no cookbook or, or, script for doing a life review, but there, are, there are elements that, anybody can use according to the specifics of their own life. And there's an attitude that I think is general. So the elements and, uh, um, you know, people can take a look at what I did in my book, but the elements include 
interviewing anybody that's still around that knew you when you were young, uh, an old school teacher, an old friend from childhood, uh, friends of your parents, of course, if your parents or grandparents are alive, talking to people, helping you to verify by your memories. I have a chapter in the book about memory. Memory is a very tricky thing, and uh, we construct our memories. We, they're not snapshots. So our memories are not reliable, but we can check them out against what other people have to say about how they remembered us. So there are interviews and meeting people. There are records in schools, in the military, in early jobs that may be still available, letters. There are historical documents that even capture the period of time that you grew up in that might refresh your memory and be relevant to your own life. And anything else, uh, I think that you you just came up with one that I'd never thought of, but I think that's a fabulous idea, uh, thinking of associations that you've had with music or travel you've done. But what are... We- what are we looking so, okay. for? So yeah, that's yeah. what I could, so that's what I was going to say. That uh, that leads me into the second point I was going to make, which is the attitude or kind of the purpose of the life review. So the goal is to salvage or to rethink uh, things that have happened to you in a way that does give you a path forward. And so the number one you, thing you look at is what did I do or what did my family do? Or if you're doing ancestry records, that's meaningful. What did I do that gave me a sense of fulfillment? What did I do that was purposeful that uh, earlier in life that I accomplished that I could take some pride in or satisfaction from? And what are the things that didn't go right that I can learn lessons from, mistakes I made. That, I mean, For me, the big mistake that I made, that I learned, was that I never talked to my mother. I, my mother lived 40 years after I first got my first clue that my father was still alive. I never once sat down and had that conversation with her about what happened to this guy and why didn't you, you know, and it would have been a diff, difficult conversation. That's why I avoided it. But that was a big mistake that I learned from. And now, believe me, I'm having the conversations with my children or all the people in my life uh, before uh, you know, before it's too late. So you learn from the mistakes. And then, and this is, I think, the final thing that's really important. You have an attitude of forgiveness. Everybody makes mistakes. Every human being. There's nobody that hasn't made mistakes. So you understand why you made the mistake or why the person that hurt you made the mistake. I learned a lot more about why my father did not come back from Germany. It helped me forgive him. Forgiveness is a blessing, not just to the person you forgive, but to yourself. Uh, And so all of these things make it possible for you. They liberate you. They make it possible for you to move forward in a way that's positive, that's purposeful. And that's the attitude. So that's the goal of the life review is to salvage all of those and redeem. That's really the key word. Redeem all those experiences from the ones that were positive and fulfilling to the ones that were difficult, even possibly um, things that you totally regret, mistakes that you wish you hadn't made. But find if you can find silver linings. And even if you can't find silver linings, and you know there are always things that happen that of course, you wish hadn't happened, and life can be terribly tragic and catastrophic. And so, I don't want to be glib about this. Uh, there are things that, of course, we all wish didn't happen. But at the very least, what you can say is two things. You can say, you know, I did the best I could at the time, and I'm human, and to err is human. And secondly, for whatever happened, I am the person I am now. And I wouldn't be otherwise. And I value that person. That person was a bridge to who I am. Let's just say there were mistakes made or what have you. Yep. That person is an avatar bridge to me. That's right. And and everybody and I had to go through that right. That's right. I had to I had to be that person in order to get to this person. That's right. And as a psychologist, I can say that nobody wants to be another person psychologically. You can look at the, you know, the, the, the most wealthy person that seems to have the most fortunate circumstances in the world. 
And you could wish you had those circumstances, but you don't want to experience life like that person. If somebody said, I can do a brain transplant, and you, now all of a sudden you're that person, people will re resist that. They want to stick to their own identity. And that's what you've got to hold on to is the person I am now that's experiencing this world. I wouldn't be that person if I didn't have we're all We're multiple of those people, aren't we, uh, Bill? I mean, we're, we're multiple selves, I, I, in a sense, right? We're, well, like Walt Whitman said, you know, we encompass <laughs> we, multitudes, uh, and I think that is true. And we want to embrace who we are. That's what the great psychologist integrate. Eric Erickson. Yeah, yeah. yeah th th and that's what the great psychologist Eric Erickson said. What you really want in life is ego integrity, which is the sense of integration that you accept and you integrate all of the experiences and the things you've done and you embrace them. And that's how you avoid despair as you enter the final stages in life. And you, you just, said it you're you're not looking back and approving you're but you're accepting okay that's this, right this that's right this is self-acceptance i was going to ask how do you do this without being stuck in the past because i i think a lot of people aren't moving forward because they are in well, whatever happened 15 10 whatever yeah and that was butler's whole point in developing the life review because he said too many people they look into the past and they just get nostalgic and uh, they uh, exactly get stuck there. And then they start getting regretful and that just leads downhill. And the whole idea, and that's why I said the attitude is important, is that when you're looking back, you're looking intentionally to find memories that give you something you can redeem, something that either the memories are actually things that you are proud of and you say, well, you know, when I was 16, I actually did this and it was pretty good. Or I made this mistake, but it led to this and led to that, and I've learned from it. Or I've learned how to forgive this person or forgive myself. And so you look, you, you're very intentional about choosing it, memories and thinking about them in the way that give you that positive way forward and not getting stuck in the past. Okay, exactly. so it's critical, you know, from a set standpoint, when you do this, you're pining for gold. What could be positive? What was positive? In in how do I? I don't only put words in your mouth, but but you you're you you have to be careful to approach this in a in a positive way to say, hey, yeah. what what is the draw? You know, what is the gold from the draws here that I can pull forward? That's uh, right, and and okay. you may and you may not be ready for that. Uh, as a final thing, I'll say that's a, that, that's a good uh, point. I was not ready to do this when I was 20 years old or 40 years old. I was too threatened by the idea of my father, and uh, I just wasn't ready. But at age 60, and when my daughter, I thank her for that phone call, uh, when my daughter opened up that possibility for me, I finally was ready to do it. So uh, you, you, you should wait until you really feel, yeah, I, I'm capable of thinking about these difficult things in a positive way. And I wouldn't advise doing it if uh, earlier uh, than you, you feel, you know, you feel very confident that yeah. you can uh, think about that that way. I, the other thing I was thinking about, Bill, is that for people that are going through life changes right now, disruptions, we talk about job losses and what have you, or divorces, whatever, but you you could actually do a review of what you come through the other side of in other words how many times have you lost a job and you you eventually found yeah, one? how many like times that. have you gone through a relationship but and said that you would never get another one but you did you know I so like th th like this it. is that, that's great yep these are things that we forget but it's like wait a minute you've been here before yes. in that's a excellent. different situation or, or state or place but you've been here before and you did make it and uh, your future is probably going to replicate that same thing. You're, you know, you, everything's been okay. Everything's yeah, that's been okay. It's always been that's okay. It. That's exactly in the spirit of Robert Butler's life review, the life review that Robert Butler developed, which uh, it's in exactly that spirit. And that's what I, that's what I borrowed from. That's what I ad uh, adapted to my own case study of one person, namely me, uh, as I wrote the book, A Round of Golf with My Father. When we go through those things, we forget of, what strengths that we have pulled from them and that we have with us, you know, we, 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 we forget it that, Hey, we actually did pull ourselves up. We, we, yeah. we did get ourselves together and yes. that capacity is still there. Yeah. yeah. Look at what you 
went through already. So yeah, we yeah, can do in it. some situations, it, you, you may be better off. Either you have more resources, more experience, more age, you, you have more capacity than you did have just by road of being where you are. You know, you're not. Yeah, I, you, you, you know the the most powerful four words in the English language. I can do it. Yes, yes, Bill. Thank you. This is this has been great. I, I I really appreciate you sharing your story, and and it's a it's a great book. You also have a book on noble purpose. Yes, um, we didn't a, even a get into book. that. But, that's uh, a little uh, small book that I wrote before I wrote the Path to Purpose. That kind of primed me to write the Path to Purpose. But that's right. That that book is still out there too. Noble. It's a very small book. Yeah. So anyway, I point to people to those books and and uh, Bill, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you again. I really enjoyed it, Larry. And thank you for your story, too. It's uh, it's terrific talking to you, really. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed it, do share it with your friends and on your social platforms. Big thanks to Sam Williams, my audio guy. And the beautiful bumper music you're hearing is Michael Petrovich's Bella Luna. For all my show notes or resource links, visit LarryWeeks.com, and we will talk again soon. Mm-hmm.